welcome everyone back to the Picanono show. I am really happy today to have Ron Unz with me. How are you doing, Ron? Fine, fine. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, I guess uh, my original background was in theoretical physics. And then uh, basically in the mid 80s, I got involved in financial in computer software for a while. And then uh, by the 90s and afterwards, I really became much more involved in public policy and politics and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, I'm uh, involved in doing some initiative campaigns, both in California and the rest of the country. And then in the last 15 or 20 years, I really uh, gotten involved in a project to digitize the old archives of a lot of major American publications, you know, the sort of opinion journals that had been very influential in American society over the last 100, 150 years. And partly as I did that, I end up running across really many surprising elements of American history that I really hadn't been previously aware of. And so in the last 10 or 12 years, really a lot of my work has gone into producing a series of articles on these historical events, especially the American Pravda series, and then other things really showing that so much of what we believe we know about the past, the last 100, 150 years, is really a construction more of media propaganda than the reality. And, you know, many of that obviously comes down to the present day where, you know, so much of what we find in the media really is very unreliable compared to what probably would have, we would have believed before the internet came along. Let's get the plugs uh, out up front. What's the, what's the website? Oh, uh, the website is uns.com, unz.com. That's sort of the main website. Uh, you know, it includes a lot of my articles. It's basically an alternative media website. So it provides uh, a really convenient access to a wide range of different writers and uh analysts from all across the ideological spectrum, the sort of people who write important controversial things that are generally excluded from the mainstream media, you know, left wing, right wing, libertarian, pretty much all across the spectrum. And so, you know, we cover a very wide range of different topics. And, you know, I'm sure many people who would take a look at it would very strongly agree with some of the things we publish and very strongly disagree with other things. So it's really, in a sense, a lot like the op-ed pages of a major newspaper, but with a very much broadened range of views and possibilities presented. Yeah, and I must say the, uh, the aforementioned American Pravda series, I hope that people go and read that. I was telling Ron before we started recording, um, by going through that series, my library increased in my <laughs> and I, I ended up reading a lot of books that I wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have otherwise and you've also digitized a lot of those books on the on the website too so that's a great resource as well exactly exactly we're you know we're trying to sort of make things much more easily available for people so that they can see you know a lot of perspectives that they certainly wouldn't get from the mainstream media or even a lot of you know other websites or podcasters or that sort of thing. All right, let's just jump into it. Um, I've been saying that since October 7th, the world, um, politics, narratives, a lot of things have changed since then. And it's been something to watch. Um, I, I think more, even more so than the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Um, what was your take on October 7th? What was, uh, when, when you saw what was happening and, you know, I, I guess, especially the reaction by the Zionist faction, what were you thinking? Oh, well, obviously I was very surprised. In other words, the Middle East had really been quite quiet for probably about a decade or so. And, you know, in a sense, there had been very little violence or controversy, especially surrounding Gaza. In other words, everybody assumed that the Israeli government had really nailed Gaza down completely shut, you know, with all of their sophisticated defenses, with their garrisons around Gaza. I mean, it seemed that, you know, the likelihood of any raid by the Palestinians or Hamas was really negligible. And so I was absolutely shocked when the story suddenly came out that, you know, probably something like 1,500 Hamas militants 
had successfully broken through the billion dollar defensive system that the Israelis had put together, you know, to isolate Gaza and, you know, basically uh, to keep it under wraps. And, you know, not only that, but it successfully overrun a number of the Israeli military bases surrounding Gaza and really captured and, you know, taken back to Gaza, a couple of hundred Israeli soldiers and civilians. I mean, it was an astonishing achievement. I mean, the fact that, you know, lightly armed Hamas militants under the watchful eye of all of the Israeli intelligence and national security forces had been able to stage an operation like that was just, you know, absolutely astonishing. That's obviously one reason why you know a lot of people, especially in the alternative media, are very suspicious about what happened and think that it was some sort of Israeli government conspiracy. Though I, I'm very doubtful of that. I mean, it, it really was probably the greatest, in many respects, the greatest strategic defeat Israel had suffered at least in 50 years, possibly since the foundation of the state. Because you know, basically, close to 1,200 Israelis were killed by the Hamas militants, about half of them being Israeli military forces or national security forces. And I mean, that's a tremendous defeat for Israel to suffer. I mean, I, I think that's probably more casualties Israel had suffered than in the last nearly 50 years combined in all of the other wars and military actions. And for that to be inflicted not by an organized military equipped with planes, tanks, anti-tank missiles, you know, all the modern weapons of war, but lightly armed Hamas militants basically carrying rocket-propelled RPGs and uh, assault rifles. So, I mean, it was just, you know, a very shocking development. And obviously, the Israelis were just as shocked as everybody else. And their initial reaction showed how panic-stricken they were, which, you know, is one reason. I mean, most of the evidence that seems to have come out shows that many, probably even most, of the Israeli casualties were actually, uh, civilian casualties at least, were actually inflicted by the trigger-happy and panicked Israeli military forces. For example, there are videos showing the Israeli attack helicopters, Apache attack helicopters, just being ordered to shoot anything that moves. And uh, there, there is a video, for example, showing probably a couple of hundred incinerated Israeli cars, which were in many cases being driven by some of the civilians fleeing that dance festival, or in some cases being driven by Hamas militants taking captives back to uh, Gaza. And, you know, that's probably where the majority of the Israeli civilians died. So, I mean, it was just, you know, absolutely shocking development and tremendously humiliating for Israel since, I mean, Israel had been recognized both by its supporters and by its opponents as probably having one of the world's best intelligence services. And, you know, despite having ac complete access to Gaza, Gaza being surrounded on all sides by Israeli security defenses, and, you know, with the Israelis allegedly having, you know, such excellent equipment at infiltrating and keeping a watchful eye on any of the Hamas militants. I mean, the Israelis were completely taken by surprise. In fact, dozens of Israeli uh, senior off of high ranking Israeli officers were killed by the Hamas militants in the fighting that followed. And some of the Israel, uh, some of the elite troops of the Israelis were actually defeated in battle or their bases were overrun. So, I mean, it was absolutely shocking development. And again, very humiliating for Israel, given the effort had gone for decades to maintain its reputation as having an invincible army and an unparalleled quality of national of intelligence services. So, you know, I was as shocked as anybody probably in the world. When you take into consideration how long it took Israel to retaliate, I would have expected them to do something very quickly. Um, to go in very quickly, but it took them, what, what do you think the implications are of them taking their time and uh, and not starting a, you know, not having an immediate reaction, but having something that's more planned that gave, um, that actually gave Hamas time to either hide or get ready? 
Well, I mean, the whole thing about it is uh, the Israelis at first, obviously, you know, as far as I can tell, were just shocked what had happened. In other words, they couldn't figure out how to react. I mean, if we're talking about the first day or two. And then after that, as far as I can tell, there was a tremendous amount of internal debate within the Israeli government as to what steps to take. Because, I mean, the thing is, uh, attacking a heavily entrenched military force in, you know, the rubble of a built-up area like Gaza is, you know, extremely difficult operation. And that's why, for example, what the Israelis did for really the first few weeks was simply to bomb the Gazan civilians, trying to drive them out of North Gaza or inflict tremendous damage to punish them for what Hamas had achieved. And then the Israeli ground operation started very late, and it seems to have been very, um, very cautious and aimed at minimizing Israeli military casualties. In other words, for example, Israeli ground forces generally have not gone in. The tanks usually have gone in by themselves, you know, making them relatively vulnerable to Hamas fighters, you know, can hit them with anti-tank guided missiles or other, you know, weapons like that. So, I mean, it, it basically, as far as I can tell, the Israelis have not really, even three months into the operation, have captured only a very limited ground within Gaza by their, you know, ground military forces. And I mean, probably only successfully occupied a small fraction of the tunnels that the Hamas forces had, con had you know, constructed over the years, their defensive positions. So it's just not really at all clear whether the Israelis will have any success at seizing the ground in Gaza and, you know, in a sense, capturing or killing the Hamas militants. I mean, the Israeli propaganda has obviously gone tremendously into overdrive. And I think they've claimed that they've already killed 20% of all the Hamas force, Hamas militants, you know, thousands and thousands of them. That's total nonsense. One reason we know it's nonsense is we have the actual direct casualty figures of all the people who've been killed in Gaza. We know how many of them are men, how many of them are women, and how many are children. And the casualties inflicted in Gaza, the dead, almost exactly mirror demographically the general Hamas, uh, the general Gaza population. In other words, roughly two thirds of Gaza's, po of Gaza's population consists of women and children. And two thirds of the people killed in Gaza have been women and children. I think it's about 70%, so a little over two thirds. Now, Hamas is entirely a male op uh, operation. In other words, all Hamas militants are male. So if the Israelis were kill had successfully killed any substantial number of Hamas militants, the demographic casualties would be entirely different. So it seems likely that the Israelis have successfully killed no more than 1,000 or maybe 1,500 or at most 2,000 Hamas militants out of probably 30 or 40,000, according to most estimates. And meanwhile, the Israelis have really suffered very substantial casualties. I mean, again, there are a lot of claims going around that the Israeli government has been doing everything it can to keep under wraps the heavy casualties the Israelis have suffered. But supposedly, I mean, they've certainly suffered thousands and thousands of wound victims. And, you know, there are all these uh, videos produced by Hamas showing successful attacks on Israeli armored vehicles, tanks, bulldozers, everything like that. I mean, and, and the interesting thing is there's absolutely no comparable evidence of the Israelis successfully engaging Hamas forces. For example, there was that one case, the Israelis were under such pressure to produce allegedly captured Hamas uh, fighters that they basically seized a large number of completely civilian Gazan residents, male Gazan residents, and you know basically humiliated them, stripped them down to their underwear and portrayed them as being Hamas militants, even though there's absolutely no evidence they were. And in fact, later when some of them were interviewed, it's very clear they were simply male residents of Gaza who were captured. So, you know, the fact that the Israelis have not produced any of the sort of videos that the Hamas militants are producing of successful attacks on the opposing forces tends, I think, to confirm the fact that the Israelis are having a very hard time of it. And I mean, in fact, what the Israelis have really done is simply concentrate entirely on killing 
the ordinary residents of Gaza, the ordinary civilian residents of Gaza, and especially destroying all their building, buildings, all their civilian infrastructure in hopes of driving them permanently out of Gaza. And in fact, some of the Israeli government leaders have specifically said that. Their plan is to basically drive the you know, two million residents of Gaza out of the place where they're living, drive them into the Sinai desert of Egypt or some other location. And you know, that, that makes it a gigantic war crime. And as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, there now are official charges being filed with the International Court of Justice claiming that Israel is basically committing what amounts to a genocide. And the fact that so many Israeli political leaders and military leaders have used such extremely genocidal language in their public statements, obviously, you know, gives them a very hard time to defend themselves against those charges. So, I mean, it's just a really absolutely shocking situation. I mean, the Israelis have probably, you know, the Gazan health ministry, despite all the problems and, you know, the destruction it's faced with, has recorded, I think, by now 25 or 26,000 deaths by name, uh, you know, gender, age, and uh, ID number. So, I mean, those are very solid numbers. And when you look at all the thousands and thousands of Gazan residents who are listed and missing and who are buried under the rubble of the 100,000 building that the Israeli bombing has destroyed, I mean, the true total is probably 30,000, 35,000, possibly even more than that. I mean, it's the greatest... It, it's the greatest televised slaughter of civilians in the history of the world. And it's absolutely shocking that the United States and the West, you know, countries that, for example, have lambasted Russia for occasionally accidentally killing Ukrainian civilians in some of their missile attacks, have basically not only allowed Israel to go on with this, but have actively resupplied the Israelis with all of the huge bombs that have never previously been used in, you know, in basically densely populated urban areas like this. So it's just an absolutely shocking thing. And I think in the long run, it's absolutely disastrous for Israel's position, both in the region and around the world. I mean, all of this is being televised on Al Jazeera and on YouTube and on Twitter and all of these websites. I mean, people are seeing all of these thousands and thousands of children being killed by this massive Israeli bombardment, which I, in fact, the figures I've seen, I think the Israelis have dropped more, the equivalent of several nuclear weapons worth of bomb tonnage on this densely populated urban area. And, you know, that's something that's never previously been done in the history of the world or at least since the Second World War. Yeah. Let's talk about the propaganda. Do you do you see this propaganda as just being as sloppy as it is, or is it just now that people have the ability to check it in real time? I mean, Walter Lippmann is spinning in his grave. This is some of the right. worst propaganda I've ever seen. It is what, 40, 40 exactly, dead or beheaded babies um, baked in an oven P Pedoritz fell for that one and went crazy so many of them spiraled it just seems that either the propaganda is just completely out of control we've seen it we've seen it all before the the um the babies baked in the oven i mean that, that i can find a, a saint petersburg newspaper from mm -hmm. 1903 talking about the you know the um the black hundreds doing that and is it just that? Is it that the, the propaganda doesn't work anymore because people can check it in real time, or are they just getting sloppy? I, I think the second factor is probably the most important thing. In other words, one interesting thought experiment for each of us would be, what would we know about what was going on in Gaza and the uh, military conflict with Israel if the internet didn't exist? if social media didn't exist, if YouTube and the other video platforms didn't exist, if all we had to go on were the major daily newspapers or the broadcast electronic media, our entire picture of the conflict would be totally different. And I, I think the fact that, for example, there are all these other avent, all these other channels of information is probably one of the reasons the Israeli propagandists have been so desperate 
that they've gone into overdrive with all these stories of, you know, 40 beheaded babies and things like that. So, you know, I, I think it's basically that, you know, if we were locked down and all we had, all we knew about the world and what was going on in the Middle East was from, you know, the major television networks, possibly plus CNN and, you know, uh, Fox News and our daily newspapers or magazines. I, I think, you know, we would be getting such a one-sided picture that probably, except for those of us who were very, very suspicious or very knowledgeable about the details of, you know, the regional conflict or our special personal sources of information, I think very little of any of this would have been, you know, come to our attention. In other words, you know, if we think of what we see in the daily newspapers, I mean, it's so different than what we discover over the internet. I, I think that's really the main thing. And, you know, it takes a while for propagandists to get used to the fact that not only have they lost control of the narrative, but that, you know, some of these ridiculous stories they come up with can be checked and rebutted in real time, you know, in a matter of minutes or hours or days rather than, you know, sitting around. And even so, I mean, for example, I've actually heard that many, many Americans right now still actually believe in that 40 beheaded babies nonsense, even though it was, you know, immediately debunked. And not all, I mean, basically, the Israelis have reported that only one baby, one shot young infant was killed in the entire attack, you know, in the crossfire with the, a shootout with the Hamas forces. And so if only one baby has been killed, you can't obviously, you obviously can't have 40 beheaded babies. But I've seen people basically still say, cite that as an example of Hamas's brutality, because, you know, they're the individuals who are not going to other sources of information. They're not scouring the internet. They're not looking at other YouTube channels. They're basically just going on what they heard probably on CNN or some of the pundits they follow, or, you know, by the sort of people who amplify that message when it first came out. So, you know, it's basically that, you know, it's unclear to me what fraction of ordinary Americans are seeing through the propaganda. In fact, actually, that relates to another point. When you look at, for example, the age distribution of views in the United States, it's generally the younger people, people who are younger than 25 or younger than 30, who focus on these alternative sources of information, who use the internet, who use social media, who look at YouTube videos, who have an entirely different picture of the conflict than you know people who are a generation or two older and have basically lived their entire lives immersed in the sort of propaganda of Hollywood and the broadcast media that you know has been extremely one-sided about the Middle East conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Yeah, well, let's take a look at the surrounding nations, uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, how they're reacting to this. I think one thing that has happened recently that I didn't know that I would think that I would see that six months ago was Saudi Arabia, Egypt, um, Ethiopia. They've all joined BRICS. Oh, exactly. Exactly. I mean, some of that was, I think, in the pipeline long before this development took place, you know, the, uh, the uh, Hamas uh, conflict with Israel. But I mean, certainly it's accelerated all of those factors. I mean, basically, you know, Americans may not be getting broadcast coverage of, you know, the thousands and thousands of dead and wounded and crippled civilians in Gaza. But that's exactly what people in the Middle East are getting on their regular broadcast channels. So, I mean, the, the incredible anger and resentment that they're seeing basically that they're getting from their screens and that, you know, is rippling through the entire Middle East, the entire Muslim world, the entire Arab world, I, I think is a gigantic long-term strategic defeat for the Israelis and the West in general, certainly including the Americans, because we're resupplying the Israelis. And that's why there's so much support for what the Houthis of Yemen are doing in terms of imposing a blockade on Israeli shipping to try to basically put pressure on the Israelis to allow food, water, medicine, and fuel back into Gaza. And it's the sort of thing where, you know, at this stage, I mean, the Israelis basically, I, I think the only thing that probably is preventing a larger war from breaking on the Middle East 
is the fear of is Israel's nuclear option. In fact, you know, if you take, for example, Turkey, the Turks have a very large and powerful conventional military. And the president of Turkey denounced what was going on in Gaza in the strongest possible terms. In fact, in one of his speeches, you know, with speaking before a million Turkish uh, resident Turk, Turks in an outdoor demonstration or speaking before, you know, the standing ovations of his parliament, he said the Turkish troops eventually probably would be fighting in the streets of Gaza. I think the only factor that is keeping back these forces is fear of Israel's nuclear option. Because, you know, Israel has nuclear weapons. And the fact that Israel has been so willing to kill tens of thousands of Gazan civilians with these mass bombing campaigns, you know, certainly raises concerns that Israel would use nuclear weapons in the Middle East if they suffered a major conventional defeat. So, you know, something like that. I mean, you know, when you're talking about nuclear weapons, I mean, all bets are suddenly off. And I think the same factors involved also with regard to why countries like Russia have not intervened in the Middle East. I mean, right now, for example, according to all the reports I've read, Russia, China, and even to some extent Iran have hypersonic conventional missiles that could very easily destroy, sink a, a U.S. carrier, could destroy our U.S. carrier capability. And so the fact that we sent a couple of carrier flotillas into the area to try to sober, sort of overawe any of the regional powers. I mean, I, I, I mean, carriers basically are just sitting ducks for missiles these days. And for example, you know, America's strength in the world, America's the, the conventional strength of, and the power of the U.S. dollar is heavily dependent on America's carrier power. The fact that America controls the seas around the world can interdict forces in the Ukrainian war right now, America has provided, the West has provided missiles to the Ukrainians and intelligence guidance to the Ukrainians that have allowed them to sink several major Russian warships in the Black Sea. Under normal circumstances, the Russians, I think, would be very eager to play turnaround and to basically either provide weapons or themselves easily sink an American carrier, which would cause basically the collapse of American credibility around the world. I think the only reason they don't do something like that is their fear that America would go nuclear under those circumstances. And, you know, basically nuclear weapons change the entire game entirely. And so when you have a government behaving as irrational as the Israeli government is behaving in a bloodthirsty fashion with regard to Gaza, that certainly makes people concerned about the Israelis using their nuclear weapons. And the same thing is certainly true with regard to the American government and the tremendously irrational way it's been operating for years now. So, you know, I, I think basically the problem, I mean, the, the Middle East, I think, has been lost to American influence because of this Gaza massacre for probably decades to come. And I, I think Israel's future position in the Middle East is going to be an extremely difficult one. In fact, there are you know, very credible accounts that one reason the Hamas militants attacked when they did was Saudi Arabia was on the very verge of normalizing relations with Israel, which had been a top Israel political project for decades. And if that happened, I mean, basically the Saudis had forgotten about the Palestinians, the Palestinian cause had largely been forgotten across the Arab world, across the Muslim world. But by staging the sudden attack and then suffering tens of thousands of dead civilians in the Israeli counterattack, I think that has been completely taken off the table for years, probably for decades. And I mean, but basically most of the surrounding countries right now are, you know, obviously tremendously under American influence, under American financial and military control. But I, I think from what I've read, the peoples in those countries, the street, the ordinary individuals in Egypt, in Jordan, in all of these other countries would be very eager to have a war against Israel right now. And, you know, it's not clear at all that Israel could survive something like that. In other words, you know, Hezbollah has according to some reports, 100,000 rockets that could hit Israel, many of them being guided and targeted that, you know, could hit 
all of Israel suddenly is really devastate Israel's population centers. The same is certainly true of Iran. So, I mean, basically what the Israelis are doing is digging themselves into an extremely deep hole with regard to Gaza and with all the surrounding countries. And at this stage, I really don't see any, you know, way that, you know, a larger regional war can be indefinitely, you know, avoided. The, it didn't take very long after uh, 10-7 for the calls for war with Iran to you know, creep in there, you know, Lindsey Graham, Lady Graham, um, she, he, I'm sorry, he uh, was calling to flatten and, you know, nuke Iran almost immediately. And, you know, anyone who really studies Iran and looks at their topography knows that war with Iran is pretty much unwinnable. It's, it would be really hard. You'd be stuck doing just drones at that point. Any kind of flights would be suicide missions. Any kind of long range missiles would be, could be shot down because they have Russian anti, anti aircraft, uh, anti aircraft and anti missile technology. Um, so what, what is this? Is this just posturing? Is this just continuing of, uh, Netanyahu saying that, you know, two weeks until they have a bomb? I, I think it's basically the complete irrationality on the part of, you know, the neocons running the United States and their close allies in Israel. I mean, obviously part of it is Netanyahu knows that the moment the conflict ends, he's basically destroyed. He goes back to trial. He probably gets convicted of all the corruption charges against him and denounced for the tremendous failure of his uh, maintaining defenses against the militants of Gaza, which caused, you know, around 1,200 Israelis to lose their lives. So, I mean, probably Netanyahu then ends up being destroyed politically and spending the rest of his life in prison. In fact, I I've seen that, for example, Netanyahu's support in the Israeli public right now is down in single digits. It's well under 10%. And so, you know, in a sense, anything he can do to basically string things along to keep the conflict going so you can stay in office is something he has to do for personal reasons, even if it's not necessarily in the best interest of his country or following any sort of rational plan. And the American government, American politics, is so totally under control of the Israel lobby, Congress and the Biden administration, that basically they have to do pretty much whatever Netanyahu wants. In fact, you know, I mean, some perfectly plausible sensible analysts have said that probably Netanyahu has more support, more control over politics in DC than the Biden administration does. And that includes the Democratic Party. So, you know, we're talking about basically a situation where they've dug themselves into a very deep hole and they don't know how to get out. So, you know, I, I think in the case of, for example, Lindsey Graham and others talking about war in Iran, that's been a desired project of the neocons for at least 20 years now. And so I, I, I think basically we're talking about individuals who don't think things through carefully. I mean, who basically are just going with the standard rhetoric or the lobbying efforts they've been under for you know decades from all their billionaire pro-Israel donors. I mean, the whole thing about it is the Iranians have demonstrated that they've built up an extremely effective arsenal of conventional guided missiles, cruise missiles. I mean, they could hit basically all of our bases and destroy all of our bases in the Middle East. They could probably sink our carriers at sea. They could certainly dis utterly destroy all the cities of Israel. And I mean, they've concealed these missile bases apparently all across the country in isolated locations. So, I mean, there, there's basically no way any attack, either by the United States or by Israel, could destroy most of those missiles, and the, the retaliation would completely destroy all of Israel's cities. So, you know, I, I think it's basically people who simply can't come to grips with the facts that they can't have what they want, and that, you know, they basically they can't ignore... The, I mean, they the Israeli government for the last 10 years had regarded the Palestinian problem as being a solved problem. In other words, basically, the Palestinians had been suppressed in Gaza. They were basically being isolated in what amounted to the world's largest open air concentration camp. You know, the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of defenses, advanced electronic defenses and barriers around Gaza made any sort of large scale raid impossible. And so, you know, they basically, the Israeli government was moving on from that. 
trying to focus on normalizing relations with Saudi Arabia or basically trying to gain more regional ascendancy. And the fact that Hamas suddenly from nowhere came out and inflicted such strong military defeats on some of Israel's elite units the first 24 hours, I think was very, very shocking to the Israeli public. And they simply don't know how to react. According to some of the reports I've heard, something like 500,000 Israelis have already left the country. Because, I mean, basically, with all the dangers going on with, you know, the risk of a larger Middle East war or the risk of, for example, further Hamas raids or attacks by Hezbollah in the north, I mean, it just makes it a very difficult place to live. And in fact, uh, there are some estimates, whether it's 100,000 or 200,000 Israelis who've had to leave their homes in the area around Gaza or in the north within the range of Hezbollah's rockets and missiles. I mean, they're basically... Israel has, you know, right now has the equivalent of probably a couple of hundred internal displaced refugees, which is putting tremendous pressure on Netanyahu's government to attack and destroy Hezbollah so as to drive them from the border and allow, you know, those Israelis to go back to that area. But I mean, war with Hezbollah would be a tremendously dangerous undertaking, and Israel probably would suffer tremendous damage from that. So, you know, that's why, for example, the Netanyahu government is hoping to try to get America involved in the fighting against Iran or against Hezbollah or against some of these regional adversaries. And, you know, as we see, I mean, the Americans right now are having a very, very difficult time being able to even cope with the Houthis in Yemen who don't have even a small fraction of the mil advanced military hardware of Hezbollah, let alone Iran. So, I, I, I mean, it's just a very, very difficult predicament for America, the West, and Israel right now, and it's not clear how they'll cope with it. Well, one of the, something that happened because of all of this. Oh, sorry. Was that, um, you had anti-Semitism claims at home. You started having, I mean, really all around the world, especially Western Europe, you had all these marches of, um, you know, people that had basically migrants that, uh, you know, if you if you believe Barbara Lerner Specter, um, <laughs> Jews wanted in to infiltrate these countries to make a more multicultural and that doesn't seem to have worked out so well and it also doesn't seem to have worked out so well that um anti-white teachings in colleges um have dominated and it seems that most students are looking at um israelis and zionists as anti-white colonizers and a week ago you you wrote an article called um Jews and anti-Semitism at Harvard. So what um, when you look at what happened, not not only all the political, um, the foreign policy kind of um, implications, what are the implications at home when you when you see college uh, college presidents being dragged before Congress? to talk about basically the First Amendment. <laughs> exactly. It's utterly shocking. I mean, what we're talking about is basically, again, you know, the largest televised massacre of helpless civilians in the history of the world. I mean, obviously, for example, you know, in Rwanda, the Tutsis were massacred by the Hutus, but I mean, those were basically African villagers. Nobody saw it. All people knew were basically a few news stories that came out, you know, sometimes weeks or months later. So, I mean, here we're basically seeing on video all of these civilians being dragged out of their destroyed building, all the hospitals destroyed, all the universities destroyed, the schools destroyed, food, water, medicine, fuel being cut off to the entire civilian population. I mean, it's just an utterly shocking, you know, event. And I mean, it's so many orders of magnitude worse than anything the Russians can be accused of doing in Ukraine, let alone, for example, the alleged genocide of the Uyghurs in China, which, as far as I can tell, doesn't involve a single death. I mean, here we're talking about tens of thousands of innocent civilians being slaughtered in a relentless bombing campaign against, you know, basically no organized military force on the other side. It's not that, you know, Gaza is defended by fighters or tanks or tanks 
or you know anti uh, anti aircraft missiles. I mean, basically, the Israelis are simply using their largest the largest bombs in their inventory, two thousand palms bombs, to level all of Gaza. They've destroyed a hundred thousand buildings. So you know, again, obviously, the fact that the Israelis are considered Westerners and the Gazans are considered you know third worlders. It is certainly one of the factors going into this, but I, I think much larger is the fact that this is such a gigantic massacre of helpless civilians. In other words, you know, if the same thing were happening in Ukraine, if 30,000 helpless civilians were being killed, had been killed in Ukraine by a relentless bombardment of all the civilian centers, all the population centers by, you know, a cruel Russian army, then I think, you know, the sort of outrage would have been just as severe. And the Ukrainians are obviously white Europeans. So, you know, I, I think it's probably more than anything. And also, the, the, another factor is the gigantic hypocrisy that's involved. In other words, the fact that basically Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, was classified as a war criminal, an international arrest warrant issued, because he had evacuated ethnic Russian children from a war zone to Russia so that they would be safe until the fighting ended. And on the other hand, nothing like that is being down to the Israeli government when they've killed probably 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 Gazan civilian children through massive bombing of civilian centers. Again, nothing like this has happened, at least since the Second World War. And in many cases, what's going on is worse than anything in the Second World War because the Gazans don't have any military defenses. They don't have any air defenses. I mean, you know, the tonnage dropped on Gaza is just unbelievable. And again, it's all being supplied by the Biden administration, which obviously has made much of the democratic base of the Biden administration outraged with the election coming up. And so, you know, the strength of the Israel lobby and the strength of the donors who control both political parties, I think is proven by the fact that such a large fraction of the Democrats are demand, Democratic rank and file base, the activist core of the party, are demanding a ceasefire in Gaza. And it's being totally ignored by the Biden administration. I mean, basically in 10 months, Biden will be up for election less than 10 months. And he'll he requires the voting support of these individuals. And he's totally ignoring them because the donors and the lobbyists count much more for him and his party than the voters who, you know, put him originally into office. So, I mean, it's, and uh, the anti-Semitism thing also is just unbelievable. In other words, uh, one of the, uh, one of the columnists on their website argued that, you know, over the years, the definition of anti-Semitism has changed. And now anti-Semitism has come to mean opposition to baby killing. I mean, the Israeli government has killed probably 10,000 children in Gaza, bombing their houses, bombing their churches, bombing their mosques. And basically, nobody's doing anything about it. And anybody who protests it, who denounces what's going on, denounces the slaughter of civilians, is being accused of being anti-Semitic, which is just utterly outrageous. And we, we saw, for example, as you mentioned, Two Ivy League presidents were driven from office in a matter of a few weeks. As far as I know, no previous Ivy League president had ever been forced to resign so rapidly for any ideological reason. And two of them were driven from office simply basically for refusing to crack down on anti-Israel protests on their own campuses. In other words, for maintaining freedom of political speech. So, I mean, it's just, it's absolutely outrageous. And uh, again, it shows that the American political spectrum has been shifted over in such a bizarre and extreme way that I, I think more and more people are starting to recognize, you know, the reality of what's going on. And, you know, again, I, I'm not saying nothing like this has happened with government propaganda in the past, but in the past, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have social media, we didn't have YouTube. And so now we can see the propaganda and compare it with the reality of what's going on. And the difference is absolutely stark. And I, I think that's causing a tremendous collapse in any residual credibility the mainstream media may have had, at least in those age cohorts 
which actually, you know, do get their information on something other than CNN and Fox News. Well, I think what's interesting is the how immediately they went to a rise in anti-Semitism, not only in the United States, but around the world on social media platforms. I mean, today we are talking on the day that we're talking, pictures are coming out on Twitter X showing that Elon Musk is at Auschwitz with Ben Shapiro, that they're touring, you know, they had to take Elon Musk to, to <clears throat> Auschwitz so that he could see, you know, the, the problem with allowing people to <laughs> question um, Israel, Zionism, Jewish power, Jewish overrepresentation and anything on his platform. It's and remember, we're talking about the wealthiest man in the world, the wealthiest man in the world, the owner of Tesla, the owner of SpaceX. I mean, basically, our entire space military system, the satellite system depends on it, it depends on the SpaceX company and his, um, you know, satellite company. And so, you know, the fact that he's the wealthiest in the virtual world, he controls Twitter, which is a media path platform more powerful than probably any television network maybe even as powerful as most of the television networks combined. So with all of those tremendous assets of power, he has still been totally intimidated and brought to heel by the Israel lobby. And that really shows the gigantic power of the lobby and what it can bring to bear against any individual who questions any of these issues, even basically questions what they're seeing on broadcast media or on Twitter. I mean, it's just it's just a shocking situation. So you know, I think more and more people are recognizing and are beginning to extrapolate that if what they're seeing now in the media is so dishonest relative to what they can find on Twitter, what they can find on social media, you know, they're saying, well, maybe the same thing was true in the past as well. And that's really the central core of my American Pravda series. In other words, it's arguing that many of these similar propagandistic efforts had occurred in the past very successfully because they couldn't be challenged. In other words, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, if you controlled or dominated the newspapers, the magazines, the, and eventually the radio and television networks, you could create whatever view of reality you wanted. And except for a few fringe individuals here or there, nobody would ever question it. So, you know, the, the point is one, I think, problem many of these supporters of Israel have gotten themselves into is they may be opening doors without realizing it, that they would have preferred keeping shut. And take, for example, the issue of what happened to the Palestinians. I mean, you know, people who've known, who followed the issue, have known for decades that the Palestinians, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, were driven out by the, Israel, by the Zionist forces in the 48 war, were expelled from their homes, many of them killed in the process. It was one of the largest ethnic cleansings in the history of the world. And it occurred in Israel. You know, people who had been living there for centuries were driven out of their homes by people who had just arrived, in many cases, in the previous five or 10 years and who used military force tremendous, you know, on a civilian population, you know, slaughter them in many cases, massacre them to encourage them to leave. All of that was covered up from the West and from the American public for 50 or 60 years. And then now suddenly in the last 10 years or 15 years, and especially in the last few months, more and more people are becoming aware of what happened back then. And once they learn the truth of the matter, I think their picture of the Middle East conflict will be very different. To give you one example of that, you know, China basically has tried to take a very neutral position on the issue. In other words, China, you know, is not directly involved in the Middle East conflict. And, you know, once good relations, both China has had a long history of good economic ties with Israel and also once good relations with the other countries in the region. But Chinese media is not biased in the way the Western media is totally biased. And one of the main uh, influencers is somebody with a huge number, with I think a million or two million followers on Chinese social media, just polled his ordinary followers 
on who is right and who is wrong in the situation. In other words, is it the Palestinians or is it the Israelis? And 98% of them supported the Palestinians. 98% of what probably was a relatively ordinary sample of Chinese residents. Because, I mean, the facts are so incredibly clear cut. And once people start to realize that, you know, all of these ridiculous stories, like the beheaded babies, the roasted babies, were just propaganda, they may then start to go back and question whether other things in the last 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, may have been similar propaganda, but propaganda that was used before the internet came along to allow it to be second-guessed and debunked. And I think something like that may eventually cause a revolution in America, in the views of the American public on a whole range of different issues. Well, I think once people start to realize that the history, that, that one part, especially an important part of history has been, uh, yeah, has been changed. I mean, you 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 wrote a great book, um, Revisionist History of World War II, and I think that's to me that's one of the most important things. If we can change the narrative of World War II, then we, uh, you know, because basically the regime we have in charge now started in the New Deal in World War II. I mean, we're living in you know, the the narrative of World War II basically it became the the founding myth the new founding myth of the united states and it's uh you know anti-fascism and you know pro social justice equality egalitarianism everything so the more these you know the more these blocks start getting knocked away you know hopefully you have that um the house of cards just come it just comes down because it just the truth can't stay out it can't stay out um can't be hidden for as long as it has been um i i do honestly believe people when they get a little bit of truth they want to know more and they want to know more and i'm not 100 sure that um the population learning the truth will change things but definitely elites and um you know even vanguard elements will notice what's happening and try to take advantage of that. Exactly, exactly. I mean, just as, for example, in the old USSR, the Bolshevik Revolution was the founding myth of the Soviet Union. And when it collapsed, when people no longer believed in it, that was one of the key factors that brought the Soviet Union down. And I think what we're really seeing now, especially in the last 20 years, and most strongly in the last few years, is what seems to be an ongoing collapse of the American system. I mean, in a sense, a system now that seems just as decrepit as the old Soviet Union was in the 1970s. In other words, you know, when I was growing up in the 1970s, you know, the Soviet Union seemed so musty, old-fashioned, unsuccessful, decaying, that, you know, I and really many of my friends assumed at some point or another it would collapse. And, you know, I'm not sure, for example, right now, if we're looking at the American system in the same way, I don't know whether we're 1975 or 1982 or 1987, but I think we're getting very close to a collapse of the American system that has been built up over, just as you say, since the Second World War period. I mean, there are so many things going wrong in so many different ways. I mean, you know, just a couple of years ago, when, you know, basically a lifelong crim career criminal died of a drug overdose, as far as I can tell, based on all the evidence, we had the largest riots, looting, and urban unrest in probably 50 years in the United States. I mean, we, we, you know, basically a complete collapse of, you know, the tearing down of our statues. I mean, basically uh, almost what amounted to a cultural revolution in American society. You know, we, we've had just, you know, in the last year or two, we've had the highest inflation we've had for decades. I mean, we have gigantic budget deficits. We have, you know, basically, we have trillion dollar trade deficits. We have trillion dollar budget deficits. I mean, we have a military budget that's totally out of control in spending and still can't seem to produce artillery shells to send to the Ukrainians. I mean, these are exactly the sort of signs of collapsing decrepitude that I think were so visible in the old Soviet Union 
you know, not that long before it collapsed. And I mean, you know, right now, for example, think of the political system. We have a situation right now, and you know, I'm not I, very mixed feelings of someone like Donald Trump, but right now, according to all the polls, Donald Trump is about to win an overwhelming victory in the Republican nomination. So he's the Republican nominee. And according to all the polls, he'll probably be elected president of the United States while being prosecuted for 80 or 90 felonies. I mean, there's a very real possibility. Donald Trump will be elected president of the United States while sitting on his cot in a prison cell, which is just extraordinary. Nobody like that would have imagined anything along those lines being possible even five or 10 years ago. So, I mean, it's just bizarre what's going on in the United States. And, you know, these are all the things. I mean, we have so many things happening at the same time from so many different directions that I think, you know, it reminds me very much of, you know, the latter days of the old Soviet Union. Yeah. I um, Back in September or October of 2021, I, uh, I said on my pot on this show that we're basically at the point where we're a banana republic with air conditioning or for right now we have air conditioning because the electricity still works. I don't know how much the competency crisis is going to uh, keep that going mm -hmm. either, but you know, I live very rural and um, you know, like Elon, I have, I have internet because of mm -hmm. Elon Musk and the people around me, they're all the same. They're like, we don't want to go near cities. Um, we have our chickens, we have our cows, we have everything out here we want. Um, let's just sit back and watch what happens. And, you know, the, and these aren't people who aren't uninformed. These are people who are very, very um, plugged into the alternative media. And, you know, read, read books that, you know, we talk about where we can only get them on eBay and we overpay mm -hmm. for them. And it's, it's truly remarkable because, 10, 10 years ago, no one, it, the, the acceleration on it, the, I think the, I, I really honestly think the, the culture war and making everything racial really is what woke, what woke a lot of people up to it and made them say, well, I don't think politics is the answer, but you know, Hey, let's, let's, let's make sure that our farm uh, our, our farm is doing really well. We're seeing more and more things break down in our society. And, you know, I, I think more and more people are asking themselves, you know, whether this is a sign of something very, very deep and rotten. And I, I think, you know, a lot of those people will, just as you were saying, go back to the roots of our modern era. And, you know, basically the entire world that we live in right now was largely created as a consequence of the Second World War. And if we start to understand that many aspects of the Second World War were very different than what we've taught in our history books, that suddenly, I think, changes people's feelings about a lot of things. I mean, for example, in my case, I always had a very conventional view of all these historical issues. And one of the reasons my views changed was digitizing in the early 2000s, these old archives of publications and noticing that, you know, America's leading publications of that era sometimes had headlines and articles that were utterly different from what I would have imagined, from what I learned in the history books. So, you know, once you start to discover that there were so many things happening in that era that were totally different than what you learned in college or graduate school or in the media or in films or in newspapers, I mean, at that point, you really start to become much more suspicious about many other things. And, you know, as you start investigating, you find that it's all out there on the internet. Now, you know, I'm somebody, for example, I personally think that 90 to 95% of all the so-called conspiracy theories I find on the internet probably turn out to be false or unsubstantiated. But that remaining 5% is of such enormous importance it entirely changes our view of the world on so many of the crucial things in our society and our history. So, you know, I think as more and more people start to have doubts about some of these things and doubts about the effectiveness of our government and the honesty of our government and the honesty and responsiveness of our political leadership,
they might start looking into some of those issues. And I think in many cases, be absolutely shocked at what they find. Well, I appreciate the talk. Uh, I hope to have you back on again. Maybe, maybe someday we can just talk talk about some history. Maybe uh, talk about talk about your book, especially the one from the, the Second World War. That's a good one. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the recording now. Just um, stick around. I want to ask you one question when we stop. So, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me.